Elon was, you know, investor in Series A. He was very supportive always, you know, financially and on the board. Uh, and then he became the CEO. He's actually the fourth, I think that's right, yes. the fourth CEO of, of Tesla. And he has taken second it. Second chairman of the board. <laughs> second chairman of the board. And he's taken it, you know, to, uh, to heights that are, you know, fantastic. So he's done, a, you know, an amazing job. But, yeah, and he, again, he was always supportive, you know, from the beginning, but he, he wasn't the founder in the, in the sense of he wasn't, you know, we, we started it. Well, but I mean, this, okay. this is one of the things that I found kind of, kind of uh, fascinating about him is that, you know, he's actually accomplished some amazing things he's, in is, his own he, right. I he's, think. A, he's totally amazing. Yeah, SpaceX is amazing and, you know, he's done some interesting things with Tesla for sure. I'm not sure why he has to also say that he was a founder when he wasn't. I don't understand that. Eberhard and Tarpening met in the 1980s and in 1997 they founded Nuvo Media where they created the first ever ebook reader called the Rocket Ebook. The idea for Tesla came from Martin's love of sports cars. For various reasons, I had been thinking about buying a, a, a sports car. Um, and this was at a time when- One of many sports cars that he had. Well, I was times. thinking about buying a more serious okay, one. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. All right, I had just gotten divorced and it was what you do when you get divorced. <laughs> so um, so uh, in the end, you know, I'm looking at these cars that look like a lot of fun, but got, you know, um, you know, 18 miles to the gallon or something. And this is at a time when it seemed very obvious to me that the wars that we were having in the Middle East had something to do with oil. And it seemed uh, also becoming more and more obvious that this global warming thing was real. And in the end, I couldn't buy a car like that. That was just at the time when the car companies who had been selling electric cars in California had managed to get the zero emissions vehicle mandate gutted just at the time when I thought I might go buy an electric car, maybe an EV1 or something. Uh, they were no longer available. They were actually being taken off the market. And in fact, if, if it was an EV1 or any of the other leased EVs, they were actually taken back from the owners and destroyed. I had talked about this with Mark, and Mark was uh, reasonably skeptical <laughs> and, yeah. and, uh, and asked me a lot of questions about, about, well, I mean, what is the right technology if it's not going to be uh, a gasoline-powered car? Well, so I, I wound up doing the math. I wound up uh, calculating the well-to-wheel -well energy efficiency of every kind of transportation I could think of. Of course, fuel cells, gasoline, diesel, um, biofuels, uh, electric cars. Electric cars where the electricity is made from coal, where it's made from natural gas, where it's made from oil. And it was a surprise to both of us that every which way I did the numbers, the electric cars were a lot better than everything else. Though Eberhard and Tarpening had worked together in hardware and consumer electronics, neither of them had any automotive experience. Before I had thought about starting a car company, before I proposed that, I had searched the internet for who might make a car still, now that all the big guys were out, and there was, a, there was a small company in Southern California called AC Propulsion that had made exactly three of a little kind of a handmade kind of a sports car-y thing. It was, it was you know, very homemade. Uh, Go-kartish. Go right, yeah, and, and so I contacted this company and, and, and uh, spoke to them, and they were actually busy going out of business because the majority of their income had come from doing small projects for the car companies as they were trying to make electric car demonstrations. But, but now that the electric car, the, the, the zero emissions vehicle mandate had been gutted, all that business went away. So they were going out of business. So I reached out and, and actually rescued them. I invested some of my own money into the company and, and tried to get them to build me personally a car. That car was a lead acid powered car and, and uh, was therefore very short range and the batteries were persnickety and uh, dangerous. And so in my conversations with them, I said, well, why don't we consider lithium ion batteries? We had learned a lot about lithium ion batteries from our work on the electronic books. Our first generation of that product used nickel metal hydride batteries, and then we learned and switched over to, to lithium ion batteries for the second generation. So I had proposed, was this possible? And it turns out that some of the folks there had been thinking about that too. So I basically financed them to convert their car to a kind of a crude lithium ion battery pack uh, for that thing. So that's where it began. Uh, and that was a proof of concept that actually would work despite the limitations of that car. Yeah. One of the things in terms of, of, of how we you know, found investors and how we kind of figured out how to make the car at the beginning was an electric car is a bunch of computers, it's uh, batteries, it's motors, and then there's the sort of car around it. <laughs> and the problem is, is that Silicon Valley does those first things really, really well. So I was pretty convinced, you know, working with Martin and we were looking through the numbers and that it was going to be possible to make the thing that made the car go. But I was very concerned we weren't going to be able to make the car to go around it. After Eberhard and Tarpening came up with the idea for the battery, the next hurdle was to build the car around it. They discovered it was fairly common for automotive companies to outsource certain aspects of manufacturing. So they started looking for a partner and reached out to an English company called Lotus. 
We uh, flew down to Los Angeles for the 2002, I guess, uh, um, auto show, yeah. the LA auto show. And uh, hunted around and found the, the Lotus booth and basically forced ourselves upon the Lotus people. <laughs> we forced him to sit and listen to our presentation, which he did. Yeah. And was intrigued. Yeah, was intrigued enough that he said, well, you know, come to Hethel, which is in England, and, and we can talk more about this, basically. And I think that was a great gatekeeper because anyone who wasn't serious wasn't going to fly to England, you know, and yeah. go do that. Um, but of course we did. Lotus was able to write a letter for us that said, if this company can do what it says and gets funded and everything else, We'll be their partner. We might be their partner. Yeah. Might. I mean, yeah, yeah. Was well, all, it, wasn't, yeah. it wasn't legally binding, no, no, but yes. But, but it, was, it was what we needed, though, to show investors that we had a plan. We had at least a plan. And we had a couple of backups as well in how to make the car. And, and we had shown through my investment in, in AC Propulsion that one could build a battery pack that way. On July 1st, 2003, Tesla Motors was incorporated. We self funded at first. Some of my money, some of my brothers and friends and stuff like that, little bits of money here and there. And we were also touching the VC uh, uh, community, particularly ones that had made money on our previous right. investments. But it was pretty clear early on. A lot of the VCs, uh, you have to get sort of, if not consensus among the partners. Like, you know, if, if you have a big fund and you have five partners, they all kind of have to say yes. Or at least you can't have one veto it. So yeah. it depends on the structure of the firm. But our reality distortion field wasn't good enough to get like all five partners well, to believe all the, the crazy thing is we come into these firms and we convince the tech guy who's in our space, perfectly totally understand it, and we convince a bunch of others, and we get we get actually uh, vetoed by by their biotech guy. You know, right. that's what happened. At, because I don't like sports cars. You know? Yeah, like, or, or or more than that, I'm an expert in sports cars, and you don't know anything. Right. That was more. I mean, because almost every VC is actually an expert on on, on cars. Yeah, yeah, they're actually and they're above average drivers, all yeah. of them. Yeah. I, I'm sure. Yeah, yeah. And then we encountered Elon, uh, and you can talk well, about. Well, so we we had we had met Elon before in a in a different way. That we're both yeah. uh, um, space enthusiasts or whatever, and we were. Uh, we were founding members of the Mars Society, numbers 14 and 15, I believe. I we think, are. yeah, we have our yeah. lifetime memberships. Yeah, and, and we, uh, we went to a talk that the Mars Society had put on. It was, uh, a, it was at, their, their conference. Yes, it was their the annual conference. Yeah. Happened to be and, and one of the speakers was Musk, and he was intriguing. Mm -hmm. So we cornered him afterwards and, and talked to him for a while, and that was, that was nice. That was, that was, that was sort of right. it. Uh, and then later on, uh, I had a gentleman's agreement with the management at AC Propulsion, who was also out trying to get money. And they had, they had uh, chased down Elon Musk and had tried to persuade oh, no. him to invest in AC Propulsion. And the chemistry between the AC Propulsion team and Musk was not going to work. And they tried for a while. And after a while, they realized they're just not going to get the deal. And the, 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 the president of AC Propulsion called me up at that point and says, OK, I'm giving up on those guys. You can go ahead and talk to Musk now. Yep. So, so, I, so I, I sent an email off to, to, to Elon saying, uh, basically saying, you know, we met at the Marshes. I don't know if you remember that, but uh, we had this idea, and I'd like to come and talk to you. That was interesting because this is he, so. When we met him at the Mars Society, he hadn't started SpaceX yet. He hadn't. That was not in his vision yet. He was trying trying to launch some experiment with missiles from Russia or something. I'm not exactly sure what it was, but he gave up on that and decided to do SpaceX. So when we went down, uh, it was at SpaceX's original headquarters, I think their first headquarters yeah. down there in Hawthorne or wherever it is, and. One of the great things about pitching to Elon in this context is that a lot of times we would pitch to the VCs and, and to other you know, angels, and they would say, what you're trying to do is so crazy. You know, you're <laughs> trying to make an electric sports car. That's insane. And we are pitching to somebody who is actually trying to make rocket ships. And so in you context, couldn't really say that. <laughs> right, in context, he, see, he was like, oh, yeah, I got that. This, yeah. this seems, you know, and, this and, is and, and he got our, our, our idea, our vision right away. I mean, yeah. we, in our original presentation, we said, look, we need to change the way the world thinks about electric cars, okay? Today, people think about electric cars as little ugly things that nobody wants to drive. Uh, and, and, and we know we can make an electric car that's very different. So to change the way people think about that, we need to make something that's radically different than what, uh, than what people expect. And so we'd like to make something as a, as a high performance sports car to, to, to destroy that old image of what electric cars were. And then follow that up with, with more mainstream cars getting more, moving down market as it becomes more, more possible. And he got that. Yeah, he yeah. Was like, he, yeah was, he totally sense. got it. Yeah. Yeah. In April of 2004, Musk invested $6.35 million of his own money in the Series A round to help get Tesla Motors off the ground and became chairman of the board. We sat down at one of our local coffee shops and I proposed to you, could we architect a battery system using the battery management um, knowledge that we had from, from, from the Rocketbook and scale that up to the size of a car battery? And we, we penciled that out 
maybe even on napkins or something in, in the coffee shop. And, and no, engineering pads. We didn't. That's we, true. We, we always had our engineering that's pads true. with us. But we persuaded ourselves that it was, it was, it was, it, it was, it was actually feasible. What was challenging? What was it like? Just what are your Everything was challenging. Every, everything's hard. <laughs> everything, everything. We were inventing from scratch. This was something that had never yeah. been done before. Right. Yeah. And, and just, you know, handling that many cells was a problem mechanically and, and, and sort of making sure that they're safe and you're dealing so, with all. So do you other, remember when we came back from that conference where they had done a... Um, Somebody was talking about the, the danger of these lithium ion batteries. It was just at the time when, when in the news were suddenly a bunch of laptop fires. There weren't very many of them, but they were quite dramatic, and they, the videos went viral on, on the internet. Uh, and so our team took some of the cells outside, charged them up, and forced them into thermal runaway, and they were very exciting. Mm -hmm. So then we ma made a, a, uh, a small uh, representation of what we thought our, our large battery pack was going to be like. We went up to my house up here in the hills, dug a big hole in the ground, put that down in the ground, put a camera down in there, put a big piece of plywood on top of it and a lot of weight, and then force that, that group of, of cells into thermal runaway to see what happened. And the, it was very exciting. And the result of that was our first really big schedule slip. That was when we yeah. said that until we get a, a handle on this, this lithium ion safety issue, it's a day-for-day it's a -day schedule slip right. until we figure it out. Yeah, and, and I want to say we never did that again. After, after that, that one really thing, fun. no, at your house, <laughs> I mean, you know, we, we then uh, rented a fire pad you know, a yep. fire pad on the bay, you know, controlled by the fire marshal from that point on. Yep. Well, that was partially we then learned. It's like, oh, we really need to take this in, right. a, in a way that we... Right, and, really and that was the right thing to do. I mean, yeah. and this was, you know, it's one of these things where we, we saw there was a potential problem and we went and learned that lesson pretty right. quickly. And it was, it was, and this is where, you know, basically I set as the company's gold standard that you have to prove on the battery design that, that, you, you, you should be able to assume that any of your cells in your battery system will, for reasons you don't understand, go into thermal runaway, and you have to prove that when it does, it does not propagate to adjacent cells. That was the rule yeah. we set, and it took a while before we could do that. Right. How would you describe the greatest innovations around that battery pack and safety? We had, we had a crew of, of people working out how to do this battery system. I mean, you know, how, to, how to mount the cells, how to cool them. We invented this cooling tube that went through them, how to make the electrical connection. We originally tried to use uh, uh, resistance welding, which was the, the no normal way of doing electrical connection to cells, to, to lithium ion cells, until we came along. We discovered that that was, was unreliable and uh, and worse than that, you, you couldn't tell if, if you made a good weld or not at the time of, of, of assembly. And, and we, we, we experimented with a lot of different ways to do that and finally settled on wire bonding, which has then become the, 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 what everybody copies now when you're making a, 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 a cylindrical cell battery pack. Yeah. So we had to invent a lot of stuff, and there was a lot of trial and error, trying different kinds of glues to make the cooling system work, inventing different kinds of cooling tubes, different kinds of insulation. Everything had to be invented from scratch. There was no state of the art. Nobody had ever, ever considered taking you know, nearly 7,000 cells and putting them all together into a battery pack. Nobody had ever done that at all. It was, it was insane when we described it to people. Right. So, so today, I mean, today, all of the battery management systems in every electric car today is based on that work, all of them. In 2006, Tesla unveiled the prototype of its first car, the Roadster. The all-electric sports car sparked a lot of interest before it was even for sale. The launch event, I don't know, it's, <laughs> A ton of people inside of a big tent. It was really, really loud. Um, I had my kids there. They were little at that point. My, my daughter was dressed up in a beautiful little white dress, and my son was in a tuxedo. He was very proud of himself. He was, you know, four or something. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, uh, and we had these cars going around, and, and uh, you know, I stood up and gave a talk about what the car was doing and welcoming people and so on and inviting everybody to get in the car and drive. And I don't know. It went on for until... We are all exhausted. <laughs> yeah. Oh, no, the, the, I have a very distinct memory is that before the event starts, so we're still setting up, we still, you know, we're, we're no visitors are coming yep. in for another, you know, two hours. I mean, it's really early. And there had been a rumor that Governor Schwarzenegger, who's yeah. governor at the time, might, might show up. But, you know, like, who knows, right? So, so we're there, and I'm with one of the other engineers, and we're, you know, the, literally moving chairs around and getting stuff. And in walks Schwarzenegger and his sort of entourage. He goes, where are the cars? And yep. he comes, yeah. And that, I, it, we, yep. neither of us, we were both, we were, it was such a surprise. And it was hours before it was, we were ready. And we just kind of pointed. We didn't say anything. We, and, he's, and he walks over you know, and gets in one. It was great. Can you tell us a little bit about how you innovated in terms of the sales and why you did that? 
in terms of taking pre-orders, and for, correct me if I'm wrong, but that was really not in our original plan. We would do um, show and tells, show and tells, you know, of, of various prototypes, and and we had receptions at the R and D center, yep. you know, our offices in San Carlos, and uh, you know, and it was all about you know, keeping our customers engaged and letting them come along on the journey because yeah. it really was a journey and we didn't really know exactly the timing and, you know, we were quite open about, oh, we had a setback here or, yeah. you know, or this went really well and, and we, that... We put pictures up of internals of the things yeah, and, and discussed and we had, we had customers literally say, like, this is the most exciting thing I've been involved in. Yeah. Even though, in some level, they just wrote a check but they were they but they they believed in the vision enough to write that check yeah. and now they're participating in this process that we were going through right. you know what ended up happening is those people as we were coming out of stealth mode and people would or we were still in stealth mode but as more people found out about us they would come and say i want to be on the list even before that some a bunch of our smaller investors or individuals <laughs> right. would yes. say well i want to buy a car and i'll just give you i'll pay for it now yeah, the whole thing. I'll put a hundred thousand dollars on down now, yeah, I, and I want to be on the list, and 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 I want to know what place I am on the list. Right. And we didn't have a list, and it was not part well, of. We did. The, I made but, one. Well, no, I know. It was but, a spreadsheet on my computer. <laughs> right, but, but we made it in, in response exactly. to, uh, to incoming demand, yes. Yes. which was it wasn't like we had this you know clever marketing thing we were going to. do. I mean, we just people kept asking. So then we said, well, you know, actually there is clear interest in this. What can we do from a business perspective to make this work? And a way of supporting the customers as they as they make these commitments to us, uh, and that's how we came up with the whole program. You know, there were many technical setbacks, and that just happens in a startup. For us, I would say the thing that turned out to be the hardest that we didn't know at all, that totally caught us by surprise, was the difficulty of getting suppliers to supply yes, stuff for us. Right? Totally. We originally planned to use a lot more more standard technologies, for example, ordinary door handles rather than electric door handles, uh, and. Um, and as we, as we changed to more and more exotic ideas along the way, we, we took on more and more risk of that. But nonetheless, I mean, just getting a supplier to supply us with airbags. I mean, right. the airbag supplier would look at us and say, first of all, the amount of, of airbags you're going to buy is what a, a normal car company would buy for a, pro, for a prototype run, for, for their you know, the cars that never get sold, and that's it. And on the other hand, uh, you don't have deep pockets. So all we see is risk. So, it, 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 so the, to persuade them to, to, to actually be willing to sell us airbags, seat belts, door latches, you know, any kind of safety component, it, it was, everyone was a struggle. Yeah, we, that was something we just didn't anticipate. And we knew it would be hard, but we didn't know how no, hard. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> we just assumed that the suppliers, you know, would be willing to work with us in a way that they, what they weren't. And that was something that Lotus really helped us with because yeah. they had those existing supplier relationships. Do you want to say anything about key players who were there in the early days with you? Oh, I, you know, I kind of think the whole gang of them were pretty yeah. good. I don't know. I mean, what that early crew put up with in the early days. Yeah. Yeah. When JB likes to call himself a founder, it's, it's, uh, it's funny because um, Tristan started the same day. <laughs> That's right. So yeah. if he's a founder, so is she. Yeah. Right? right? So she was uh, one of our software engineers, really first rate. Yeah. Um, and. Uh, and now she's just you know, quietly going on with her life and she was as much a founder as, as JB was. In the summer of 2007, Eberhard was replaced as CEO and left the company a few months later. Musk eventually became the fourth CEO of the company and has held that role since October of 2008. Can you describe the moment that you realized you could no longer be part of Tesla? No. <laughs> Is there anything you can say about why you left? Uh, no, uh, well, you know, <laughs> Uh, I, I was voted off the island, and in a, in a rather rude way, uh, and uh, and uh, it, it wound up with uh, some lawsuits and some settlements, and I, uh, you know, it, it's it's his history now. Yeah, so I can't say a lot about it. Yeah, so so I he got I, to wear the white hat. I know. Right I, I, I did not do that. <laughs> uh, when I left Tesla, we had just the roadster was was essentially finished, and we were waiting on one particular super annoying thing dealing with the transmission and changing some power electronics which nearly tanked the company. That's one of those near-death experiences of the company. And we were reassigning all of the engineers to the new sedan project which we'd been working on in a small level for the previous year or so. And as the engineers would come off the design team for the Roadster we were shifting over to the, to the Model S. And I looked at that and I had three little kids at home and I'd been doing nothing but Tesla for five years, and I thought it's going to be another five years, and Martin wasn't there anymore, it wasn't as much fun, and I thought, yeah, it's time to leave. 
and I don't have any regrets. It was an awesome time. Yeah. It, the whole thing was wonderful from the beginning to the end. It was, you know, the worst and the best, and uh, and it's worked out great. Tesla re started the electric vehicle revolution. Without Tesla, there would not be electric cars today. And electric cars are the most important change in the automotive industry. It's transforming the entire auto industry, and it all comes from what we did at Tesla. If, if you look at the original business plan we wrote for Tesla, we described in great detail the Tesla Roadster, and we said, once this car is successful, the next car we should make is either a, uh, a large SUV, an expensive SUV, uh, or a, a large um, uh, sedan. Uh, and once that's successful, the next car would be down market, a sedan for a smaller size market. So it is more or less following what we predicted. I mean, not in the details, but in the, in the, in the, uh, in the big picture, it's exactly what we thought should be done. Yeah, the, the sedan market is enormously large. It's much, much bigger than, than the uh, sports car <laughs> market, the roadster market. And then below that is the sort of you know, Model 3 uh, segment of that market. And if you're going to have a big impact, you, you have to play there. Well, but you can't start there because the capital requirements are just, exactly. just too vast. And you don't know what you're doing yet. You, know, you have to learn and develop the technology along the way. Now, st starting, starting with the sports car was actually really smart, not just because it, it changed the image of the electric car, but it was a small market. And the typical sports car buyer is fairly forgiving of, for example, um, very crude interiors of the car. You know, we, we had a very, very simple enter entertainment system. The seats were, you know, not electric. With a, everything was fairly simple on it. And the kinds of customers with sports cars actually like that kind of stuff. They like the quirkiness of it. And they'll tolerate even mistakes in the car that require recall the car as long as you treat the customer well. Does the Elon today, does that look like the Elon you knew in 2003? I think Elon's Elonness has increased over the years. No. If you had to describe him in a nutshell. No. <laughs> I mean, if you wanted to describe Elon Musk in a nutshell, I don't think he would fit in a nutshell. Yeah, Elon is, is complicated. You know, he's, he's, you know, real smart and, you know, delves into everything, which can be both a positive and a negative. He pushes, he pushes on certain uh, things, you know, the, in the development that you, you, you know, kind of wonder why. And sometimes it makes sense and sometimes it doesn't. And he's, you know, He's very much into risk, you know, he, he's willing to take on risks, you know, financial risks, you know, for himself personally and, and you know, technology risks when he's working on something new that uh, are a little, you know, out there, but when it works, it's really amazing, but of course, there's lots of sort of collateral damage along the way, but, you know, it's, it's a way, you know, it's a mm -hmm. way that, to make things work. Tesla has done a great job of building a loyal fan base. They still have. Uh, they, it, it, their, their, their followers will, will accept anything from them. People want to, you know, they want to do something that makes a difference. And yes. I think it's, it's still, you know, it's, it's, it still has that excitement. At least I hope it, I hope it does. I mean, it's reached across from the early adopters into a more mainstream audience, and that's, right. you know, that's, that's critical. And, and, of course, a lot of, a lot of people now who are buying the cars are just buying a car in some sense, which is, in a way, better, right? It's, it's kind what, of made it we, we did it. We, you know, we yeah. got across that chasm. Although, even then, you know, I will hear people that have no idea that I'm associated with Tesla anyway, they'll say, oh, we just got our Model 3 or whatever, and it's, it's so great, and I just love I mean. They're into it in a but, way but the, that they're the, not in a The, the main thing Porsche. is that they just drive differently. You, yeah, they're you, you way, go way for a drive in drive. a Tesla, and it, it does not drive like your previous gasoline car. It's more fun. Would you say you're still rooting for Tesla today? Uh, I'm, of course, rooting for Tesla. I'm still a shareholder. <laughs> and I'm, uh, I'm uh, still very interested to see that the mission that we pushed Tesla on in the beginning succeeds, for sure. Yeah, the, the, the mission is so important. And you know, as a shareholder, I want it to be successful. Uh, yeah. So yes, so, we want Tesla. I mean, to be I mean one of those kind of aha moments early on in the days of, of, of Tesla, before Al Gore came out with his, his movie, he was lecturing at various places around the country, and we and a couple of our staff went to go hear him speak at uh, at Stanford. Stanford. As we walked out, one of our one of our colleagues, Ron, um, said, you know, because he was shaken by the talk also, and he, yeah. he said, "We've got to do something about this. We have to do something." And I said, "Ron, what do you think we're doing? Yeah, <laughs> That's the whole point of the company."